Okay, it works. <laughs> like, yes, but you are like to me. You're oh, like sideways. I mean, oh, wait. Can you see me now? Yeah, I can see you. Perfect. <laughs> I'll just hold it. It's fine. I'm on this uh, this my iPad. <laughs> Anywho, sorry. Um, let me no, go ahead not. and um, get everything my, started. My <laughs> um, and I set up this uh, new tripod that I have literally like 10 minutes before it even started. So it's like everything is kind of like all over the place right now for me. But oh, you're fine. I, I, just, I just kicked the family out the house. <laughs> yes, uh, Grayson is like peeking in. Like, what's this new light that you have? I want to like question you about as you start your show. Oh. So, <laughs> yes, um, I guess to start things off, uh, my name is Stephanie Jack, and this is the Iconoclast series of 2020 uh, going into 2021. And what Iconoclast is about is. Essentially, what the word means is we are breaking the mold and um, the majority and what our society believes to be um, important or things that we are used to seeing as as what's most important. We have individuals now who are breaking um, breaking the mold of what our society deems uh, necessary to talk about. And this particular evening, I have the lovely uh, Tiana <laughs> Stiff with us, and the topic is, it's a very specific topic because this will be the first time I would say that I have a space specifically around um, domestic partnership and parenting and what that looks like as far as uh, being a mom. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to talk about this with you. Yeah, I'm I'm really thankful that you even, you know, invited me to come and share this space with you. I think that we obviously can definitely relate, um, you know, even though we went to the same high school, but it's like we're, we're crossing paths now as we're older um, and we're, you know, in these relationships and we're, we have our families. So, <laughs> hey, Yvonne. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really grateful um, that you even identified me as somebody who you know is trying to to overcome barriers and is trying to you know look past you know where I've come from or you know mm -hmm. just what I've dealt with in life and just seeing that I'm even making the effort you know to make strides for not just myself but for our children so of course thank you yes um so I guess um what I would like to ask you is what words do you feel resemble who you are as an individual? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I definitely believe that um, I take initiative. I feel like when I have my mind set on something, you know, despite what it might seem or it might seem impossible to other people, I feel like I'm able to take the initiative because I know, you know, what the greater purpose is because of who my source is, I know that I'm capable of achieving that. And um, I also just feel like I'm passionate. And, you know, sometimes it might get perceived the wrong way. But, you know, I, I genuinely care. And I just ultimately want, you know, what's best for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I've also learned that I have to be mindful and realize, you know, what is best for Tiana and so I feel like that is really where I'm at in life right now is just figuring that out you know aside from motherhood and from the relationship so I, I love that because when I asked you this uh on November 26th it was just outgoing go get her taking initiative and I love the way that you still have that there but you're able to um to touch base with who you are right now in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what things do you feel from your story uh, needs to be talked about or normalized? Um, just in terms of, you know, if we're going to dive right in, you know, to the partnership and relationship, um, I definitely feel like uh, us as women, um, and there's nothing wrong with it, but we've definitely 
not even just women, but in general, there's this been this idea of what it means to be in a relationship and, and what it looks like. And I feel like, you know, now we're seeing that, you know, relationship isn't just about, you know, having a wedding or, or, or getting married. It's, it's deeper than that. It's digging deeper with who your partner is and, and being able to really know who, who that person is. And I think that because I've seen different relationships in my life, um, not not make it or or end up in divorce or whatever it may be um it's just made me more intentional about my relationship um you know in terms of like you know we have been together for a long time but knowing that it's okay that we're not married yet you know what i'm saying like there's a lot of stigmas and and, and perceptions about marriage and and what that's supposed to look like and I have my definition of marriage and I know what I want that to look like. And I'm not saying that, you know, marriage is off the table or anything like that, but it's really like not allowing the outside influences of, you know, other people um, define what that is for me. That's my cousin. <laughs> and so, uh, and it really is crazy because I've been with this, you know, this person for almost eight years, but I was a kid then, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't really know who I was and I'm still evolving. And, you know, then you add a child in that. So I've just feel like just people not feeling pressured um, to have that ring or to have that wedding and really being focused on, okay, is this person really my soulmate? Mm. You know, I think they're the right person for me, but am I the right person for them? And it really requires not just looking at them, but also looking at yourself because you can't be with somebody and expect them to validate you. And that's something that, you know, me and my partner, we realized and had conversations about is that we've really looked for each other for that validation. And even though it's okay, we really, you know, we deserve each other's support and everything. I have to be whole within myself. He has to be whole within himself so that we can really move forward, you know, in pursuing mm. the vision that we feel like God has for our lives. And that's not going to be based off of a ring. So... I feel like that's not saying that marriage is on the table. That's not that's not dismissing marriage at all. I'm definitely not because I'm a wholehearted believer in marriage and do believe that I'm going to get married one day. Um, you know what I'm saying? By society standards, I'm not married, but I know who my husband is. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not I'm not just sitting here. You know what I'm saying? But I'm working on myself. He's working on his self, so we can see to do the best that we can individually, but as a collective and for our family. And um, I just think that that's so, so important. Because I remember you were saying that, I don't know, when you found out you got pregnant with your son, I guess people were, like, asking you about marriage. That was the first thing, right? Or mm -hmm. that came up yeah. in the conversation. Um, it came up twice. Uh, in, in, well, I remember it specifically with, with both uh, pregnancies. Because, of course, um, I we weren't living together in the first pregnancy. And it was just kind of like, oh, well... Um, that whole dynamic of like that, that saying that they say about the cow and like you get all of the benefits from the cow and this and that, but um, it was kind of that aspect. And then for sure, when I was pregnant again, um, I remember uh, my partner's aunt saying something along the lines of like, oh, well, if you have two kids, you're for sure a family now. So you got to get married. And then it's like, mm -hmm. you know, like my grandfather, and just other people that are supposed to be like big key people in my life. Um, that's the only way that they can um, have conversation with me. That's the only like defense mechanism that they have instead of asking, you know, how my life is. They just assume um, two different things, whether that be um, why you are married. And then the other side, which is very interesting is, is that he is here, he's present and all of that. But then it's like, Oh, we're worried about him not being present and he's going to leave and he's going to do all these different things. A marriage don't keep a man. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> a marriage does not keep a man. A marriage does not keep, keep a household together. Uh, kids don't keep people together. Like no. none of that. It really boils down to the two people and knowing yourself within your relationship and knowing yourself outside your relationship. And obviously mm -hmm. I'm not married. I'm not, I've never been married. So I'm not here to judge, but I just know what true partnership looks like with somebody and just continuing to build that with who I'm with. I'm not perfect at all. Like we've had some up and ups and downs and a lot that's even these past two weeks that has been revealed to me 
um, that I've been working on, you know what I'm saying? And that's outside of my relationship so that I can be whole within myself and, and come back and be able to, to be who it is that I need to be as a partner and as a mother. But I definitely feel like it's not something, you know, marriage is something very sacred. And I feel like it's obviously something in my, in my beliefs, it is something that is between me, my, my partner and God. But, mm. you know, I feel like, it's not something that has to be brought up all the time in the family functions or that we should be looked at as less just because we haven't, you know, taken that step or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? But I always, I definitely know that that's always, you know, in the back of people's mind and, and mm. questioning that, but that comes with us just continuing to be, you know, if that communication is open and you know what the intent in your relationship is, then you don't need that validation from other people. And, and I've realized that. And I feel like that at one point that definitely did bother me. And I'll admit it because it's easier to say it now than to just sit there and be like, oh, that doesn't bother me. No, it's very true. Like at some point as a female, you know, we have that, you know, we all, I'm sure little girls growing up, we've had that image of what the wedding would look like, the dress would look like. And that's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and every woman, you know, deserves whatever it is that they desire you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. but i just don't want anybody to feel less than if they're not there yet you know what i'm saying and i just feel like i'm realizing now that i have so much that i want to work on and you know so that i can be the wife that i'm going to be in, in the in the and continue to be the mother that i am but i shouldn't base that off of what society deems because there's a difference between having a lavish wedding and having a marriage in my opinion. So I agree. <laughs> um, there was something that you said, let me see. You said that us as people or who we are is a reflection of what was implemented in the environment we grew up in. And so I feel like that is a perfect segue into um, talking about growing up in different households because you and I have experienced um, different environments and how we were raised and how that translates into how we do the things that we do now so if you want to share uh your experience yeah so I um obviously you know I feel like I was very blessed um with my life in terms of you know my two-parent household my mother and father being being there being present um showing up for us and and supporting us but um I also, you know, unfortunately, my parents did end up getting a divorce. And I know that that took a, a big toll on me in mm -hmm. terms of just um, seeing that, you know, I kind of put my parents on this, this pedestal. And I feel like a lot of people that were around us did as well. Um, but I don't, I don't, you know, I, I've got, I've tried to move forward with it in, in the new relationships that have came from that marriage, uh, from that divorce. But it just kind of just showed me, you know, the importance of it's okay. It's it's good to, you know, care about your children, love on your children. But that foundation, that foundation in that marriage, that foundation between, you know, you and your partner is what sets the tone for everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, both my parents have handled the divorce differently. So it's not really a something that we've necessarily been able to really discuss. But... I love my parents and um, their divorce, honestly, it just, it just taught me more to just, it just pushed me closer to, you know, work dealing whatever it is that I have going on and, and making sure that I find the right things that I need in my partner and, and just building upon that. But um, growing up, you know, I have a very supportive father um, and I'm very grateful for his presence, but I also realized that, you know, our parents, you know, they only, they did the best that they could in terms of like, they went based off of what they knew. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the difference with our generation is that even if something, something doesn't sit right with us, we're going to figure it out. We're going to go seek help. We're going to do the research. We're not just going to sit here and, and be like, well, that's the way it is type thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, whereas, you know, our parents, a lot of times, for the example, if I say like with like our education, like they instilled in us, you know, college, 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 like you got to go to school, but that's not the end all be all, you know what I'm saying? So I just feel like there's, there's been a disconnect. I feel like there was a disconnect between the generations and I feel like we are the generation that are, is going to help to evolve that and keep that open line of communication between our kids and educate them and realize like you can be more than just 
getting a degree and working for somebody. Don't get me wrong. By society standards, I'm obviously educated. You know, I have a I have a bachelor's, I have a master's, and I'm I'm pursuing my MD. But that doesn't mean anything if I don't apply it and put it forth back into you know pay it forward to the next generation or you know open my child's eyes to realize like you can be more than a doctor you can be more than than what there is so i just feel like there wasn't really that that um that open line of communication about the possibilities of mm. which uh our children can be it was always about what do you want to be when you grow up not about what makes you feel good what makes you feel happy not really you know being in tune with what you're what we're really gifted with you know what i'm saying and so i get to a point in my life where i'm not i can't expect my parents validation i'm lo not looking for my parents validation anymore but i'm trying to find ways in which i got to validate myself you know what i'm saying and i have somebody that's looking after me so i know i just went on a whole big tangent but <laughs> that <laughs> my two parent household did impact that I feel like I live I live a life of really just trying to make my parents proud growing up but at some point what is your purpose you know what I'm saying what is your purpose for yourself and that is something that I'm unveiling and peeling back because I know people who are like what you grew up in a two-parent household like obviously you had it made and I understand that I'm not complaining by no means that I ever have to complain for a meal or anything like that but I'm just saying the the mental toughness and the the ability to just persevere when things don't go and I'm not able to be the perfectionist. I think that that is something that I've had to deal with and realize um, going forward. So yeah, girl. <laughs> I don't want to talk. <laughs> well, my tangent. <laughs> no, it was it was amazing. You you stayed right on the um, right on the target. Um, Yeah, it was a lot, but <laughs> I'm trying to pick which which angle I want to go at. I guess I can just start with um, my perspective and then yes. connect the two because I, I feel like there are some water. Please stop. <laughs> yes, because um, there, of course, are the, the similarities in still ha feeling that that urge to work hard. And um, I agree with the fact that. Um, there was not a focus on what makes you feel good or what your passions are versus what you need to do and what is going to get you the money in the end and the success in, in the mindset of society in the end. And so my uh, upbringing was a mixture of um, growing up with my grandparents. So living with um, my mom's parents and my mom and then having like this big family um that was so like connected and, and things and then like right down the street was my dad's grandparents so I was never yeah. far but um my mom and dad were kind of like off and on in their relationship and um they never lived together but they met each other in high school and um between that uh before I went to, I want to say like high school, I was, I lived with my mom when she was on her own for a brief period of time. Then we lived with someone who I would consider, we'll just say he was my ex stepdad. I lived with him for a good portion of uh, middle school all the way up until uh, high school. And so um, I had that experience. And then from there, I lived with my mom as uh, a single woman on her own. Uh, from the end of high school all the way until I ended up moving out after uh, a couple years of, of uh, attending college. And so what I can say in those aspects, because both of my parents had their parents in the home, and I feel like they are kind of, their stories are similar, but the um, the generational curses and traumas and things are very similar and different at the same time. I think that um, I think what parents don't realize is that your children are essentially growing up with you throughout the learning. entire process. So they're learning what you're what you're giving them. You're just wanting them to respond in certain ways. That's why you don't talk about when someone's being untruthful and all these different things where we put children in a certain um, place. And so I feel like 
I still had to prove to um, my father. I still had to prove to my mom that, uh, you know, I was going to do something besides draw or, you know, I'm going to give up this particular thing that you thought I was going to be successful at to pursue the things that I felt like I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in correlation to how I parent and how I navigate my relationship, I would say that it's very present now because of me being pregnant. I can hear, I can hear words that have been said to me Mm. um, consistently throughout my life. And of course I've grown, of course I have separated myself, but you still feel um, the pain because you are, or I feel like I am always healing and I'm not in a space to where I just have completely cut that shit off and it just doesn't hurt. Um, But I I think about the fact that uh, I can hear thoughts about like, oh, why are you doing this this way? Or, you know, why is things that way? And um, I feel like when it comes to my relationship, it just has never been anything positive. It's always been like, you know, he's cheating, right? Or, you know, it's like, you know, he doesn't really want to be with you and this and that. So if you could imagine trying to have a relationship, if both parties want to have one, that means that intimacy or in my aspect, intimacy is not um, where it should be seven years later. Um, The way in which I had to process being pregnant and having children, it came from a space of fear. It came from a place of judgment. And Mm -hmm. I had to um, validate myself over the time. And then, of course, they'll say, oh, you're doing such a great job. And we're so proud of you in the end after you've, you know, been traumatized by all the shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it's still that way. And I think that, of course, as you said before, our parents did the best that they could. But I still feel like at the end of the day, there are still people in the world that are of old age that are healthy, openly communicative human beings and can, and still will choose to be that most authentic person that they can be so that they aren't harmful to others. And I feel Mm -hmm. like, you know, that's, that's the one thing is that, yeah, they did do the best that they could at the time with what they had, but you're going to essentially go to your grave, still thinking the things that you do and contributing to your, family in a sense in a very negative way so it it hurts me I still feel sad and and um and thoughts about it but of course what I've done in substitute of that is find friends and people that build your community yeah of course I, I definitely um I definitely resonate with that it's a lot of things that you know even growing up in a two parent household and you know seeing that you know it's you know my dad was very um how I said he was you know he was the provider he was you know he was the breadwinner he he was the cook like my dad did everything but you know like I had to it's some things that I didn't necessarily learn that I'm learning now as a woman you know as a partner and as a mother that you know I need to do better I need to 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 step step up in those areas so that I can you know be what my family needs you know every family is different but I realized the needs of my family and what I was raised in, it was, it's not conducive to, to the family in the, the future that necessarily I'm building. I, I had a talk with like Chris's mom the other day and I was telling her a lot of our generation spends, spends a lot of their time healing and trying to unlearn what y'all did to us. And it wasn't trying to hurt her feelings or say that we're damaged is just that we realize that we need to process through our shit that was put on us by your shit so that mm-hmm. we can stop this shit and yeah. be better for our kids and show, you know, and show our children and show our other our next generations, you know, we might not be getting it. We, we're, we're trying, but we're just here to, to lay down the foundation for you so that you don't have to struggle, so that you are aware of, you know, your health, your wellness, your generational wealth, giving our children those opportunities to go out and be who it is that they want to be. You know what I'm saying? Not telling them to get this degree, to get this job, to get this 401k, that's not going to be necessarily reliable. You know what I'm saying? To sustain you. Don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, don't get me wrong, obviously, like pursuing medicine, you know, but I'm just saying that 
if my child has entrepreneurial a- ambitions, I'm not going to negate that. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm going to support them. I'm going to support whatever it is that truly makes him happy, you know? And I feel yeah. like, you know, my parents were very supportive. I'm not negating that, but I'm just saying it's not easy for everyone. And I realize that, especially when it, when I have a partner who is an entrepreneur, you know what I'm saying? He's always been a different type of breed. <laughs> And I think I've learned a lot from him in that aspect and seeing how he's been able to overcome and seeing his hunger. And I think that, you know, you can relate the same. You said that you learn a lot from your significant other. Um, and that's, and that's awesome. Oh yeah. Um, for sure. And I think it, it's very, of course it's, it's crazy because people don't connect the two because when you, when you make assumptions about somebody and you have this mindset of the other person, in my case, it makes me not want to even bring up my partner. It makes me not even want to like bring him around and do certain things. So it adds on to that idea that they will have of him. And so one of those things is that he doesn't really know anything. He probably just isn't really present. But most of the things that I, I know now and have learned is from his experiences and things that he's taught me and um we're only like what three years apart and um my, I have been like it's been a judgment because we're three years apart it's supposed to be the same as if we're like 10 15 years apart he's just so old and this and that so it's so many different critiques mm-hmm. but um literally him just being a grade above me in school and then like him processing things I'm now going through things where he has already experienced. So it's like he can kind of support me through those emotional changes, whether that's becoming more conscious about a specific thing or um, having a process, a new level of oppression or tackling different things that um, as an individual can be hard. And uh, yeah, just it's, it's real crazy that, you know, of course that that's what you would expect in those situations, because if you haven't, lay down the groundwork to open yourself up to learn and you're going to close yourself off to the true blessings of things. Cause they of course think that I am the only one that's present. I am the reflection of how my kids grow and prosper. Like mm. without, um, without me, they pretty much wouldn't be the kids that they are. And they, they just pretty much believe that he's just not, um, he's not really anything. He's just kind of like, an extra person that just sits in. He's like a, an extra pet in the house or like a piece of furniture that's just there. And he just witnesses everything and then he just helps make more children. I think that's how they, mm-hmm. they perceive him. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going to lie. I know that I just, I just knew that Christopher was different from what maybe my parents expected me to, to uh, go for or to date or to, to, to create a life with. And I, I get it. You had those moments of feeling uncomfortable because, like, this isn't maybe what they expected. But I've just realized that, like, I as long as I accept you, I'm learning from you. We're growing together. Like, I don't care if they're uncomfortable. Like, I just I get I get there's a point where you want your parents blessings. You want your parents support. But at the end of the day, you know, this is my household and mm. he's a part of my family and I'm not going to this is the film that we're creating together and I'm not going to let anyone, you know, disregard him or disrespect him because I don't want for anything. You know what I'm saying? I don't not reach in anybody else's pockets. Like we are sustaining ourselves. We are supporting our family, you know, and, and he takes care of me, but I don't feel like I have to validate who he is to everybody. I feel like I did to an extent before, Mm-hmm. But I'm just like, his actions will show you. And if you're willing to spend enough time with him, you're going to be able to see. So. Um, May Boo says, you have to tune out others' opinions and focus on your relationship as long as you're happy because you know the person you're dating. Of course. And yes, cousin. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, that reminded me of something because there was this time where um, – I was riding with my dad. He was like dropping me off um, home. And I basically asked him a question. I said, so is it, is it true? Or do you believe that in marriages or in relationships, you can be uh, faithful? 
And he thought I was asking him that because I was assuming that my partner was being unfaithful to me and I just wanted his guidance and his, um, his just advice on that. But I have not told him this, but essentially the reason why I asked was because he was doing things that indicated to me that he wasn't being faithful. So mm -hmm. it made me feel like, well, if you genuinely aren't happy in your marriage or you may not be, um, how, why, what is the point in getting married or what is the point in doing these certain things in relationships? It doesn't have to be necessarily marriage. Why do people do certain things when they know to their core, you aren't truly, um, wanting to have that life with that person. You just want mm -hmm. that, um, security. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I definitely feel that. I definitely, you know, I mean, there was, uh, infidelity in my parents' marriage and that kind of, you know, was a trigger to me and I'm just like wait like why do that like why put that other person through that and you know if it's not you know I don't know the situations again I don't blame the necessarily infidelity for the divorce I'm sure that obviously my parents had their own issues that didn't you know that they had been suppressing for years but I, I completely get that and I, like I said it's not it, being married doesn't make them not cheat it doesn't make people faithful to you you know what I'm saying so like like my cousin said, just being being focused on your relationship and if this is really the person that you're supposed to be with, then you're gonna compliment each other. I'm not saying you gotta i I'm not saying that a man or a woman is supposed to complete you. I'm just saying that they should be able to compliment you. Y'all don't have to be the exact same because me and Christopher, we day and night. We are not the same. But I think that's what that's where we balance each other out and we continue to bring out the best in each other and not try to make each other into what we our expectations because if you have so many it's okay to have standards there's nothing wrong with that but when you try to have these expectations on somebody and literally ch trying to change all these things about them then it's really not you know then why are you even with that person oh what she say you are already married. A ring is just a contract yeah. with your partner and God. Yes. I, I love that aspect mm -hmm. because of the fact that um, if we didn't have that physical ring that you went and bought, then what would you have? You know, even if you didn't go to the courthouse and you did all the things and whatever, I feel like you make that, you make the relationship what you want it to be. Yeah, that's but. really crazy that my cousin even brought that up. I literally... Uh, talking to my therapist last week I will sh share my therapy experience with y'all but I was talking to my therapist last week and it was like my it's the assessment process so I just like just started going to therapy mm -hmm. but um she asked me about my relationship status and she was like okay I'm just gonna check off that you're married you know because like you're yeah. obviously, you're doing everything in you know obviously like legally legal aspects of it I get that the piece of paper though once we sign that piece of paper that's not going to make me, you know, that's not going to change who we are to each other. It's not going to make us love each other anymore. You know what I'm saying? I just trying to sign that paper so I can tell them what needs to be done. If you in the hospital or, yeah. you know, something, yeah. you know, serious is going on. I, you know, and vice versa, we need to be able to look out for each other and take care of each other and respect each other's wishes. But uh, like she said, it's really yeah girl yeah we all need therapy yes <laughs> yes we all need therapy I was yeah I was actually talking to a group of friends and we were you know it was one of them girl nights and we all was just letting out and I was like dang we can't help each other with you like as much as you want to you have these friends you have friends and you know we support each other and we try to be there for each other we all dealing with something and oh, yeah, yeah. therapy is, is is a must I feel like especially for yeah all of us now mm -hmm. for sure um i have been seeing a therapist consistently since i gave birth to my daughter and it's been great um wow. honestly I didn't even know I, that. That's what's up. yeah i mentioned it a few times on here but i i try to mention it when i can because um people need to know that it's more than just you know venting you're you're actually having somebody that is coming from an unbiased space meaning that they initially don't know you and then they're trying to help you understand things that you need to um either process or mm -hmm. assess and whatever the case and 
I've been I've been very thankful for it. And I and it was it was the exact same. It was like, okay, um, I'm just gonna address, you know, we're gonna if you're comfortable with that, if you wanna, you know, call me your partner or whatever, but um essentially it's the same. It's it's definitely the same as just saying that that's your husband, I'm gonna say that. Are you comfortable mm-hmm. with that? You know? Um let's see. We talked about uh, the ba- the baby shower dynamic. So <laughs> having everybody, so this can be the the wedding dynamic as well. So all of the people that you you know you wrote down that you wanted to be at your baby shower or at your party and this and that. But then when it's time for you to live your life and you know go through with um, your life experience, those particular people that you have, have invited to that function more times than not are present in your life. And so I had talked about this, I want to say a couple months ago when I was thinking about, you know, how to hold people accountable that say that they want to be support. And these are the ways that you can, um, that you can help me. These are the ways that you can, you know, be a support space for me versus you just giving me, you know, words of affirmation. If that's all you want to do, then just say that. But mm-hmm. um, I feel like we we just focus on who we want to be at these events. But then when push comes to shove, you're ultimately dealing with things on your own. Hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely um, agree with that. I think that definitely resonates with me. Um, for me, uh, I definitely feel like I haven't seen or heard from everybody that was at the baby shower. I'm not salty about it. You know, people got their lives. People, people, you know, deal with their own things. But, I mean, I just realized, like, who's, who's really there for me and who who's like, ooh, I hope she makes it. You know what I'm saying? Like, who's just, like, kind of just peeping to, to see. But I, I genuinely have recognized and realized the people that have have been there because um, being a mother is not easy. Being a young mother is not easy. And trying to, to navigate that and still pursue your dreams, it, it can be really, it can be really challenging. Um, I'm really grateful that I spent, you know, the first year uh, of Gage's life after getting my master's program, I spent it being a stay at home mom with him. And um, I feel like that was, such a great experience for me to be able to just even be in that position to be even be able to stay at home with him. But, you know, I still had those, those women who checked into me, those friends who still checked in on me and, and, and building that community of, of, of women who, who were there for me in that season of my life. And then I have those friends who continue to be there for me and support me. And now, you know, they're supportive of my family. Um, mm. as me and Christopher continue to pursue our dreams. Um, and I just think that it, it doesn't take them necessarily being family, blood related to be a part of your tribe. But I definitely feel like um, I don't necessarily hold anything against people that, that didn't stick around or anything like that. But it just it's just a reminder of, you know, me as a person, I need to tr- also appreciate the people ha- who have been there for me. Um, in, in recognizing them and letting them know, you know, that I appreciate them. But I guess you were saying um, in terms of like m- people helping, but not necessarily just about like words of encouragement, like wh- where were you coming from with that? Or, or um, I was coming from in a space of like, um, I guess you could put it in, in, in two different spaces because if we're talking about the baby shower, right. That means that I'm thinking from a, from a doula or a birth worker's perspective Mm -hmm. as well. So you weren't, you know, learning about childbirth currently in 2020. So we're still, you know, having conversations about horror stories and, you know, giving all of these old school myths that aren't, um, you know, accurate to how I may want to parent in ways Mm -hmm. that I, you know, would like to be supported. So you're not present in that aspect. You're not present in me telling you what my birth plan is, how I want to have a safe and free birth experience. Um, Mm -hmm. And then when I know that I'm going to give birth to this baby and these are the ways that I want you to support me when I'm recovering or, Mm -hmm. you know, these are the ways that you can help as far as if um, if I decide to go back to work or I want to do certain things here is how you can support my family during that time. I don't believe that there's a lot of conversations about that because the statistics show that women are dying when they come home from the hospital or they're experiencing birth trauma or whatever the case. And 
I feel like that's that that's the one aspect because we have women that are so focused on the gender reveal, the baby shower. But then there's no work towards having a support team to get you through this mm. birth that you chose to have in a medical industrial complex and your risk of all of the things happening. Not that, to say that that always happens, but, no, it's, I mean, you know, the yeah, conditioning and the preparation. I, be, yeah. <clears throat> I, I definitely agree. And, and since we're like entering that perspective in women's birth and especially black women and minorities, um, yeah, I definitely can reflect on my own experience of being pregnant in my master's program and in this uh, public health class where they're telling me literally that black women are dying <laughs> during childbirth. And I'm just sitting here like, this is my first time ever even really hearing about this as a 22 year old, you know, pregnant, you know, trying to just make it through this master's program. I'm already stressed, you know what I'm saying? And I'm, you know, just now learning about the fact that, you know, there's a, a high chance or a high risk that, you know, all these babies are becoming motherless and, you know, because of, you know, different entities and they want to say, you know, social environmental. And it's honestly not just, it's just such a, a touchy, a touchy thing, but, you know, you realizing that we as people, it's just really important that we educate ourselves. We, you know, even as somebody who is going to be a future physician, you can't just rely on the healthcare system. You can't. And that's just coming from a real place because mm. I feel like as a future physician, I have a dual responsibility of not just to science and my knowledge, but also the social constructs that influence what people, you know, how people are perceived when they walk into a, a a medical facility or if they tell them that they're in pain and they just think that, oh, she's being dramatic or just assuming mm -hmm. that because you're black, you can tolerate the pain. You know, just those those different, you know, stigmas that are put upon us and that we're not taking, sometimes we're, we're not taking seriously. So I definitely, um, I definitely am aware of that. And I just feel like it's, it's, a, it's a bigger responsibility um, that we continue to educate ourselves about the other aspects and ways of, you know, having that birth system, like you said. Again, I'm not, obviously, I'm not against doctors, cause, you know, but I, I am fully supportive of people understanding the, the control that they have over their bodies and being able to, to educate themselves and not just relying on what one doctor tells you or that one experience but realizing you know like you said there's midwives there's there's doulas and just having a, an an, ex, an extended team and support system because you really do need that i feel like you know during my pregnancy i just wasn't aware i just didn't have the knowledge and even though i was you know obviously pursuing medicine i just didn't realize how how much goes into bringing life into this world mm -hmm. and how much it can take a toll on your body you know getting diagnosed with preeclampsia in the third trimester after being able to i worked out the whole pregnancy third trimester get preeclampsia end up in the hospital one day because i was like i can't hear i don't feel him it doesn't feel right and finding out that my blood pressure was super super high to the point where the doctor was like have you, you know, have you been able to see clearly today? Did you have blurry vision? And I'm like, no, but they're like, well, we have to deliver this baby tomorrow. And this is, you know, five weeks early. So I'm just like, I was not ready for that. My body wasn't ready for that. And I just mentally wasn't ready, but you know, that's something that I didn't even know about was preeclampsia or just the different things that, that can happen unexpectedly um with birth so i feel like that education process is very very important for women especially minority women to be aware of, not to scare them but to just take the necessary precautions and to to seek the support and whatever resources that are out there um to ensure that they have a safe and healthy delivery it might not always go as you desire but the importance is that you and that baby are still here together I agree. Um, I think that because I just I just spoke about this, um, that aspect of like, because people feel like, oh, well, you don't want to cause fear and this and that. But I feel like 
it's a way to to educate and be informed and not just feel like, oh my God, all these different things can happen to me because I feel like what makes the most sense is I'm going to be terrified if I knew nothing about preeclampsia or I knew nothing about literally anything and then I end up with a cesarean. And I thought, mm-hmm. oh, I'm going to have this particular birth outcome and then they're going to cut me open. I'm going to have surgery today. Mm-hmm. Um, versus being told all of the risks This is what it looks like to have a cesarean. This is a way that, you know, you can have a more um, intimate experience with that cesarean, meaning that Mm. you can be able to see the people that are actually operating on you, them Mm. talking to you, making sure that there are no students in the room, you know, all these different ways that you can make it um, as empowering as you can. And I feel like I wouldn't be as scared. Like, of course, there would still be fear because, you're having open, you know, open stomach and, yeah. <laughs> you know, that was surgery. My first surgery. My cesarean was my first surgery. And I was just like, that learning how to walk again and yeah. also trying to breastfeed, that was, that was a lot. And still in school that didn't really have like a maternity leave because it was a mm-hmm. spug, you know, so it was just a lot. But I'm thankful that I had um, Chris's mother who was there like helping me she had had three cesareans herself and so Mm. she was literally there for us for like the first month of gage's life um and i was i feel you know truly blessed because i don't know what what i would have been able to do if it wasn't for her being a new mom and everything like that you know we close she bathed me so yeah (laughs) so you know i'm just i'm truly grateful that i had that support system but i know not every woman you know is is able to have that but there are resources out there and there are women, you know, birth workers like yourself who are able to, who are willing and able to support people. So I just strongly encourage people to not necessarily be afraid of, of the medical system, but to be aware of your abilities and where you can take action and not wait until mm-hmm. they have the final say on your own body. Exactly. And it's it's interesting to me because the first two births that I ever attended both of those clients were in school. One of them was doing schoolwork up until she went into labor and she was exhausted. And um, it was, there was no, it was like, oh, we don't care. It was like a very much disregard for the fact that you have to give birth and you're in the middle of a pandemic and you may be struggling financially and have all these other um, situations on top of that. And I think that it's that, it's that stress of trying to meet the requirements of society. Like, Oh, I have to have, you know, this position, I have to go to school. I have to do all these different things, or I'm going to literally um, not be able to provide for my family. And Mm -hmm. it just really goes to show what is most important in um, American society. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's very, that's very true. I obviously, have been you know in the process of still dealing with that now even as i'm back in school um and trying to balance with a family and and just all the the different demands and dynamics and i honestly you know a strong support system is really is really key and it's major for me and that support system is truly christopher you know what i'm saying his mother is very helpful our parents are helpful when they can but you know he's you know he's here and he's reminding me that you are more than just this degree or you're more than just what you feel like, you know, you need to get done. Although I'm obviously pursuing this, you know, for myself and because it is my passion, I can't lose sight of what truly matters. And that is my, you know, my child and my own well being. you know what I'm saying? And my family's well being. So yeah, it's definitely something that um, we have to realize and, and not, you know, that missing that one test or that one exam isn't isn't as major as something that has to do with your your health or your family's health. So it is definitely prioritizing. That's something that I've been realizing um, in trying to just figure things out over these past uh, few weeks since I've been been on break and realizing that, like, for me personally, I struggle with a lot of anxiety and coming to terms with that and realizing that I, you know, I need some help. I need to figure out how I can manage this and what are my triggers and just, you know, really taking care of myself because it was taking a toll on my body. It was, it was really, um, 
you know, just making me feel tired and, and, mm. and almost, you know, in a way, it's some uh, signs of depression. So yeah. just finding ways to just truly take care of ourself is the most important thing. Aside from our jobs, aside from anything, we really have to just learn to show up for ourselves and, and trust ourselves and, and take care of ourselves. So I feel like that's really where I am. And, you know, a big reason why I chose to even go to therapies because I'm like, okay, I need to fix Tiana. I need to not fix me, but I need to figure out what Tiana needs and what Tiana wants so that I can show up for the people in my life and I can show up for myself, you know? Of course. Um, there is a comment. I need to go back and see. So Rain the Magnificent says, but I feel like we got to be honest with ourselves. As women, we want to be married no matter our setup, though. We tell ourselves it don't matter to quiet our own frustrations. So I wanted to kind of touch on that before I forgot because um, it kind of made me think about a certain aspect because initially I believed that um, I did want, uh, you know, a wedding or whatever the case and like the whole um, thing that you see on TV and things like that. Yeah. Um, what I would consider that to be now is completely different than that. I, I had like an idea of doing more of a, um, like an intimate thing or doing more like a surprise thing where I just have like a dinner and gathering and nobody knows what they're coming to. And if you mm. show up, you show up. And if you don't, you don't, you weren't meant to be there. And we're literally just hanging and sharing space. And then we have a, a mini ceremony, but mm. I don't believe that, um, in my heart of hearts that, I want marriage or like a wedding. I think that I want um, solidification in my relationship. I want it to feel like um, the importance of what that relationship means to both of us. I want that to be present. I don't think that that's the most important thing to me than to have, you know, this extravagant thing and then to be able to prove to, you know, um, myself or to others that we did this, this thing that y'all wanted us to do the whole time. Um, yeah yeah no i i definitely i definitely see where she's coming from and i'm not yeah. even gonna sit there and negate that because that is that is very true like i said we definitely have an image of what what marriage looks like and what what how we want it who we want there you know but like you said as you as you get older or you're maybe in a different season of your life you realize what truly matters and what that marriage or what that relationship looks like for you so i just feel like it's no there's no right or wrong way in my opinion i just know what i feel like is what's best for me and i've had that conversation with my partner you know he knows what you know what i want and we're on the same page in terms of literally like you said people probably won't even know the day that i get married you know what i'm saying they won't know i'm not normalizing that people not get married i'm not saying that at all I'm literally just saying that know what it is that you want and why you're wanting that. What is the purpose of that? Like, what is that marriage going to do? Is it, you know, is it for a societal thing or is it because you have, uh, you feel like there's a greater purpose or, or you just want to do what's, what's you, you know, what's, what aligns with what your beliefs are. So I'm, again, I just feel like it's, it's, I just respect whatever people choose, but I know that I know what's for me and, and what's for me and Christopher. And I feel like what we have planned, is going to, it's going to manifest itself. And as we do things in order or not necessarily in order, because obviously we didn't do that, but you know, things are going to, to come together. Um, but I definitely feel like regardless of what you want, don't settle. That's one thing don't settle for you know if you know what you want as a woman or even as a male and you know what your intentions are don't settle for somebody who doesn't want to get married who doesn't want you know that monogamous relationship whatever it is just don't feel like you have to settle or settle just to be married yeah and i think that that's important but i definitely um respect her her comment because it, it's true for sure um I respect that as well. And I think that the other comment she made about like she addresses her man as her uh, her boyfriend because if he dies or leaves, techni technically that's it. And I feel like um, part of the reason why I address my boyfriend or my children's father as my partner 
is I thought that over time that would just be um, a more respectable way to address him or I felt like that was something that made it seem more um, sophisticated. I've had people say, oh, well, partner sounds like if you're gay or just other ignorant shit because, mm-hmm. like, I'm trying to come up with more positive affirmations around it because, no, I don't feel like this is somebody that I'm just going on dates with and doing the shit that we used to do in high school. Like, we're yeah, developing... And that's... Oh, oh. <clears throat> and developing a life with. Sorry, I thought... <clears throat> yeah. I definitely like we literally in the same put like place like I you are way more than them little knucklehead boys we messed around with in high school like I can't put y'all on the same pedestal you know what I'm saying so it's just it's really like that's just the messiness behind the labels and the titles but yeah. I do find the the name of uh, husband and wife those are two very sacred you know titles to me and you know I I like I said I know who my husband is and like you said, just wanting to go ahead and have, like, go ahead and have that ceremony uh, that solidifies it, and it doesn't have to do with a big wedding or anything like that. But I, I definitely see um, where the the names and the choice of words, you know, it can. That's just like another way of like society, and I just feel like, again, be having that open communication with your partner and and being clear about that. Your thoughts become oh, your reality. On, so speaking into it. Exactly. And I love there's like certain individuals like um Brianna, for example, and she speaks about your divine partner. I feel like that's more beautiful to speak about than saying just your husband or your wife. Like I feel like it's 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 subjective to what you believe. And I think mm-hmm. that, you know, um as as May Boo said, um, your thoughts become your reality. So why not speak those things into existence anyway? So yeah. I feel like it, it means even more to say your divine partner or your husband or, or whatever you choose to call mm-hmm. um, the individual in your life that you care for. Um, let me see. Um, and so the other things that we touched on was just the aspects of motherhood. So, we talked about um, how motherhood has been for us. I know that you love to do um, a lot of the different Montessori aspects of <laughs> yeah. teaching um, Gage and um, mm-hmm. and that. And we talked about creating a maternity leave slash being a stay-at-home mom. And then we had like a little bit of reflection. So if you wanted to touch on any of those uh, topics, feel free. Um, I just know that like it's real, like mom guilt is real. And the we'd be lying if we say we didn't like compare ourselves or think that, you know, we're not doing enough and, you know, trying to get that our kids to take that right picture. You know, it happens. It really does. But I never want to get to a point where I feel like I'm disconnected from Gage Mm -hmm. or he feels like, you know, he's not good enough for to meet whatever standards there are, the expectations that I have. I always want to feel like I'm parenting him in a way that he feels like he can express himself and, you know, be open and, and, and truly be himself and not like feel those pressures and that we just have an open line of communication. And I just feel like that starts at a young age, you know, and, and, and instilling confidence in our children and just knowing that, you know, they're capable of doing whatever it is that they want to do um, and not just having these, not relying on our own expectations, because if we rely on our own expectations, we're going to lose sight of the great things that they're doing, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I feel very fortunate again, and that's because, and maybe that's because I also have Christopher here and he, he is a very present father um, and very hands on in realizing these things and helping, you know, instill these other attributes in Gage um, so that he's not limited. And I just feel like that's the biggest thing is never to limit Gage's abilities and ne- and ha- that he never feels like he has to limit himself mm-hmm. to make other people comfortable or to meet other people's standards. Um, 
And so, yeah, we've had those conversations about what school will look like. And I honestly don't know. Like, it's really hard to say that I want to send him to a public school, you know, and just feel like he's not going to get everything that he deserves. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, we have public school educations, but it's so much that we learn later on. You know what I'm saying? And I, you know, I just feel like that obviously he's not of age to go to school yet and we'll cross that when we get there. But it's just realizing that, you know, even with our parenting and how we educate him, it's going to, you know, be different probably from what we were exposed to. Yeah. Um, as far as like, because my son he entered his first homeschool as an option. I was going to segue into that. Uh, yeah, a, I know. A I just, I'm just <laughs> looking at my future and I don't like, I'm just trying to see how that would look. But yeah, yes. we, um, yeah, it's definitely an option. Um, So, and I will speak on the homeschool aspect because I feel like that's of course what I would want uh, for my son. He has done virtual um, pre-K this year. And then on top of that, it's a dual language pre-K. So he's learning English or I thought he was going to be learning, learning English and Spanish, <laughs> but it's primarily Spanish. And yeah. I have the experience I have with Spanish from high school and middle school. And I'm basically relearning a new language and I wanted that for him. Uh, and not to say that that's not important because I do believe it is, but what I truly want for Grayson, uh, is for him to have that, that freedom but then I also see another aspect where he is very much used to um, he's used to me and his his father being present. And at the same time, he's used to seeing us working as well. And okay. I think that being an entrepreneur and trying to balance that and now me having to do that while having multiple children, I know that I'm not going to be the best teacher a hundred percent around across mm. the board, like for what I would want to do. Cause I want to do the full fledged blues clues school aspect. And we're going to have like the best experience ever and mm -hmm. trying to go hard on that plus everything else. But I also don't want to shortchange him as well. So I am very like hesitant about what next year would look like for him because I believe that I'm not going to send him back to public school. And right. then if that's the case, would it be something where I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm paying for a school or am mm -hmm. I, you know, doing homeschool, but I have someone else here assisting with that or something like, uh, and not how our community has the little teaching our babies group. And, um, uh, some of our sister, sister friends would be helping educate our children. And, you know, we, we figure that out as we go, because there are communities that are building, um, right. community and, and teaching spaces to where kids can learn all aspects of life in a new way. And I think that us trying to just be so focused on, oh, how are they going to get a diploma? How are they going to get a GED and get the degree and get the jobs? Whereas like someone like me, I'm making double the living wage and mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't have degrees, but you know, it's, it's a process. And, and you don't have yeah, debt. No, it, not, have I, debt. I do actually. You, you got debt? You ain't got my debt. <laughs> I have like, I want to say like 12,000. Twelve thousand dollars <laughs> worth of debt, I think. But it's it's like put off. Like I'm on that program where it's like you don't have to pay it, but it's like just sitting there waiting on you to do something with it. Um, you should both look into homeschool programs. There are a community of homeschool families where I'm sure that you could get help and resources if you choose choose that. I would love to continue that conversation, Elena, yes. because um, and that would be a really com good conversation to have well, in that, terms of like. The options of so. educating our children. Oh, yeah, she's talking about our, <laughs> our HBCU. Shout out to the people with HBCUs, but that debt at a private institution? No. Yeah. 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 It's just um, recurring interest. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally just went, I went one year to fail and then come back with some debt. And then I did uh, like a year. No, I did half a semester um, at a community college, made straight A's, but I had to pay like 300 a month. And I was like, no, I'm not going to keep doing this. I need Chick Biden Chick to say money. Biden. Yeah. I need Biden to say Biden's loans, okay? <laughs> yes, but to speak on the um, the homeschool thing before I forget, because there's two, there's two things that I, I would like to touch on, because 
aside from what we teach our children on the education aspect, I think too, I'm wanting to engage in a um, learning how to, I guess, break free from the generational curses and things that we've been taught or how to unlearn things that you were taught by your parents and your, your uh, communities and different things like that, that may be toxic and not beneficial to your life currently as a parent. And so what I'm thinking I'm wanting to bring into 2021 is how I may uh, be changing the things that I do as far as communication or approaching or discipline or whatever, when it comes mm. to my children and sharing that with other uh, parents, like you being able to access those things so you can learn how to implement that, in yeah. your conversation, not just with your children, but with yourself and with other people around you, because essentially we need to reword and reframe and, and replace the things that were there so that we can essentially move towards healing. So that's the first mm -hmm. thing I want to do something where it's like parents can learn new ways to parent because of course there's no manual and there's no way to be the perfect parent, but what are some ways that we can improve and prevent um, unnecessary traumas because I am someone that is actively dealing with the ways that I respond to my child. I do still do toxic things. I do, I do still respond in ways that were taught to me, but then at the same time, I do things that are new. I do things that are um, giving him a voice and give him space and things like that. But I have to be able to address the two and work to where that side that's the more toxic and negative side I'm working on that and I'm I'm aware at the same time so I think that um that that's something I want to dive into and then at the same time I think that um there are groups and communities that are moving towards the homeschooling thing cuz I have done research mm -hmm. and there are parents like myself that may not want um religion to be the sole thing that homeschool is teaching because mm -hmm. a lot of times um with homeschool programs that are free um it's, it's solely like, like just straight teaching you whatever and it's it's no math it's like what what are we it's nothing else in that and like what if that's not what my beliefs are and I just want to mm -hmm. actually integrate different you know aspects of learning and just like how we have uh brother Danny and how he teaches he taught uh had been teaching our kids the liberal arts and we play with clay and we do all these different things that um as far as gardening where those are things they're going to need to know um on how to be self-sustainable and being able yeah. to take care of yourself too yeah. exactly and I think that definitely aligns yeah that definitely aligns with some of the monastery aspects that I've you know, try to implement and how mm. I interact with Gage and just knowing that he's very hands on um, and, you know, not relying on, you know, daycares or other people to teach him. And I really just feel like as parents, we just, you know, I know everybody's situation is different, but we put a lot of uh, expectations on the teachers, you know, at mm -hmm. least that's what I saw or have seen with like, you know, people who have older children that are in school and with the whole virtual thing. You know, they put all these demands and expectations on teachers when, you know, we're, we're their first teachers and, and things that we want, we can implement in our children. Like, they are a product of us. You know what I'm saying? Like, we have the ability to influence them, you know, at least first, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Before we throw them out there to the wolves and they're going to be exposed to different things, we are their foundation. So if there's, you know, something that we we want for our kids, like we should never settle. Uh, we should always figure out or find a way because there's a reason why, you know, it doesn't sit right with us to send them just to public school or just to say that we don't have enough time. I don't think that that's fair to the child in their future. And it's kind of robbing them of whatever opportunities, you know, that you have for like that you, you already see you know, that they need, like, why make them lack? Um, she oh, says, yeah. much respect to y'all, because most parents do not have the patience to deal with their children. Yes, mm -hmm. um, but I'll let you finish your uh Oh, your no, thoughts. no, no, it, and that's very true, and I still, I, I'm not perfect, like, I've got to practice patience, like, and, and even though Gage is little, like, I just, I'm already thinking, you know, what, what is going to be best for him? Like, I already see the type of 
person that he is and you know i want to put him in an environment where he can continue to thrive mm -hmm. and not you know you know just realize and, and be exposed to other things that you know he might not get exposed to just by going to get a a, a public school or, or whatever so i definitely would love to stay connected in terms of like the resources and whatever you know we share as parents um on how to you know, mold and, and support our children, especially, you know, as minorities and realizing that, you know, they don't, you know, there's already stigmas when you go mm -hmm. into a, a, a school and, you know, and, and expectations. And I just, you know, would want my child to feel like, I don't ever want him to feel like he's at a disadvantage. Of course. Mm -hmm. Um, Hey, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> but, um, So, yeah, I guess we should end with um, just reflection. So, I guess just things that you feel like are takeaways either from this conversation, things that you may want to address to other um, parents or um, other individuals that may be in uh, relationships that may not be marriages or whatever the case, um, anything that you feel like you would like to share? Yeah. Um, again, I just feel like uh, being able to really focus on yourself um, and not, not lose, a lot, lose sight of who you are, um, especially when you have a significant other. I feel like that is very um important um and not just having the expectation and needing them to validate you i feel like you really should trust yourself um and it's important to be whole within yourself and if you need to take time to really you know y'all don't have we, we don't have to do everything together you know find find that time and that space to really reflect and do what it is that you need to do because you know it might not be something you need. It's not something, always something you need to look for in that other person. It could be within you. You're just not being connected. Um, another thing that I thought about, um, as I was saying that I was in therapy, is that it's not just about your mental health. I know we've always talked about, like, we're, we're really hearing, you know, we don't talk about Black mental health and, you know, our, our men mental health matters. And it really does. But also think about your spiritual health. And where, like, whoever, how, whoever people choose to identify as their source, like, are you being connected with your source? And I feel like that if you're not connected to your source, which I identify my source as God, but, you know, then you're going to have a disconnect in everywhere else in your life. Everything around you is going to, you know, feel like it's shattering. But if you're connected to your source, then, you know, everything, you know, it won't, not necessarily things are going to be easy but that you're going to find your way and that things are going to work out. Um, so I just feel like that's really important that we just be in tune with ourselves. And um, especially even as parents too, um, don't feel the need to compare yourself to other people. Um, you know, do, do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself first so that you can show up for, you know, those babies that need you um and and take that time for yourself and it's not selfish self-care is not selfish so just please be mindful of that um as you're you're on this journey in this journey of life and just just trust your process is really what i would say so yeah thank you um <laughs> the, the only thing just... yeah he's in there mm -hmm. talking with uh gianna about something who knows um <laughs> The one thing that I did remember before I, I give anything is uh, there was this article that came out that I have it somewhere on my um, Instagram on this page. And it's about the fact that on average, a typical mom works 98 hours a week mm. just just doing mom stuff. So if we can put that into perspective for how we um care for one another and the fact that you know we do need that that support from each other and so I think the one thing that I've learned from you is 
is that, you know, it's important to build community and to have multiple individuals that have different walks of life as Mm -hmm. well as similar things in common so that you can have, you know, of course they always talk about having the like-minded individuals or the people that's doing something similar to you so you can feel, you know, have that connection and be able to put pieces together that you weren't before or have that validation um, that you may Mm -hmm. need. But it is good to have people that are from different walks of life so that you aren't complacent. And so I feel like, you know, um, I'm grateful for the way that life has panned out because just like with Brianna, where we never really interacted at all as kids, we came together for a purpose later Mm -hmm. on in life. Whereas that's the same situation with you, where it's like, we knew of each other. We were, cordial and friends on a certain level in high school but Mm -hmm. we didn't have the important relationship like we do now and so now we're able to have this space and share um connection that will ultimately lead to help help and healing for other individuals out there so i'm grateful for you i'm grateful for you susan (laughs) thank you i'm 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 really i'm i'm real it's it's very true being open-minded and realizing that like the people that I am friends with and in building community with, they're not necessarily the people that we didn't necessarily have to come from the same background, but we're able to learn from each other and, and to support each other and to, you know, just give a new perspective on life um, from what we thought was normal. And I'm, I'm truly grateful for that. And just, you know, pray that we can just continue to build a community and, and to, help each other show up for our children and in our mm. family. So I'm so grateful that I was even able to, to be on this call with you. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I guess in closing, thank you everybody that watched all the way to the end and anyone that catches the replay, um, you can support Rose Gold Birth by sharing any of my posts, sharing this live with someone else. Um, or even donating to my black business at the cash app Rose Gold Birth. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much. This was the um, Iconoclast series episode three with Tiana Stith um, about domestic partnership and parenting. So yeah, thank you all and have a good night. Thank you. Bye. All right. All peace. Right.